Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing pyruvate kinate deficiency. If you guys don't know, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mad Medicine, we have created a hemonc playlist where you can watch all of our lectures for USMLE Step 1, specifically hematology and oncology. While you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. Your support really means a lot to us, and we are posting brand new Step 1 videos every single day, so make sure you subscribe so you don't uh, miss them. With that being said, let's talk about normocytic and Anemias. Normocytic anemias are anemias where the red blood cell is normal. Therefore, the MCV is going to be 80 to 100. That's why we have put an arrow to this normal size red blood cell, not macrocytic, not uh, sorry, not microcytic, not macrocytic. You have a normal sized red blood cell. And these can be subdivided based off of hemolysis, especially in normocytic anemias. You can have non-hemolytic normocytic anemia and hemolytic normocytic anemia, which can be sub-subdivided based off of the cause of uh, hemolysis, whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic. So let's talk more about hemolytic hemolytic anemias. Hemolytic anemias can be intrinsic where the problem is going to be within the cell and that problem within the cell can be due to membrane defects or so problems at the, with the cell membrane. It can be due to enzyme deficiencies and that's what we're going to be discussing today, pyruvate kinate deficiency. Uh, we have already discussed the membrane defects, membrane defects, so you can watch the videos in the playlist for hereditary spherocytosis and PNH and we have already discussed G6PD deficiency, so you can watch that as well. Now, you can also have hemoglobinopathies that can lead to intrinsic problems and hemolysis. And then you have extrinsic causes where you have problems outside of the cell that leads to cell to lice. These are autoimmune issues or issues with blood vessels like micropathic, microangiopathic and macroangiopathic hemolytic anemias as well as infections. Now, because your red blood cells are being lysed, your bone marrow realizes it needs to increase production. And with that increase in production, it is going to release immature red blood cells a lot more than normal. And that's going to lead to a reticulocyte count that is going to be greater than 2% in hemolytic anemia specifically. Now remember, your normal reticulocyte count is going to be 1 to 2%. But in hemolytic anemias, you're going to have a greater than 2% uh, reticulocyte count. Also, in uh, non-hemolytic normocytic anemias, you will have normal values for the reticulocyte count. So let's talk about pyruvate kinate deficiency. This is a disorder with an enzyme that's going to lead to intrinsic hemolysis or intrinsic. Uh, it's going to be an intrinsic cause of hemolysis. This is an autosomal recessive disorder, very important for step one because they can ask you a percentage or probability to pass this disorder on. This is an autosomal recessive enzyme deficiency that causes extravascular intrinsic hemolysis. Extravascular meaning it is not going to be in the blood vessels specifically. So what happens in this disease? Well, let's talk about the pathogenesis. In this case, you have a defective pyruvate kinate enzyme. This enzyme is very important because it allows for a, a very ir important irreversible step in glycolysis, the conversion of PEP into pyruvate. And that's important because it is needed for the production of ATP. Now, when you do not have proper functioning pyruvate kinase or you have a deficiency in pyruvate kinase, you are not going to be able to produce adequate amounts of ATP. So let's write that down. A decrease in ATP is very important. Now, when it comes to your red blood cells, what happens with a decrease in ATP is that the red blood cell is going to become very rigid. And the fact that it is very rigid is not good, and it's going to allow the red blood cell to be lysed easily. Keep in mind, red blood cells normally are not rigid, and they shouldn't be rigid because when they go through the red pulp, they have to deform in order to go through a structure called the cords of Billroth. Okay, this rigidity is not good for the red pulp. I'm going to write this down for you guys so you guys remember this. We've already discussed this in our hemolysis basics video, so you can check it out. But the red pulp has these things called the, I think it's spelled like this, or cords of Billroth. And these cords of Billroth are sort of a sieve. Now, normal red blood cells are going to be able to deform and change their conformation just so they can go through it. But abnormal red blood cells, like in pyruvate kinase deficiency, are not going to be able to because they are so rigid. And they're going to get stuck in the cords of Billroth, and splenic macrophages will destroy them. That's why you see extravascular hemolysis due to an intrinsic cause. Now, you are also going to see two levels of uh, high levels of 2,3-BPG, and that leads to decreased hemoglobin affinity 
for oxygen. Now, overall, this is a very rare disorder. You're not going to see this often in the clinical setting, but you need to know it for step one. It is a very important cause of uh, hemolytic normocytic anemia, especially when it comes to testing for step one. Now, the symptoms are very important. When it comes to newborns, you're going to see hemolytic anemia, and the severity is going to range from mild hemolysis to life-threatening hemolysis. You will also see pigmented gallstones because of the hemolysis that is occurring. Now, in the physical exam in a newborn patient, you might see jaundice and hepatosplenomegaly because of the extravascular hemolysis. Remember, we said that the hemolysis is going to occur in the spleen and the liver, and because this is extravascular, not in the red blood, in the in the sorry, in the in the blood vessels, it's going to happen in the spleen or the liver and it lead to hep hepatosplenomegaly. When it comes to the labs and diagnosing these patients, you're going to see an increase in serum 2,3 BPG. You're going to see all the same things for extravascular hemolysis, but we're going to talk about some very uh, important things. Number one, in pyruvate kinate deficiency, most likely you will see a corrected reticulocyte count that is greater than or equal to 3%. What does that mean? Well, in anemias, specifically hemolytic anemias, you need to correct the reticulocyte count in order to see if the bone marrow is responding adequately to the decrease in red blood cells. If you have a reticulocyte count, let's write this, if you have a corrected reticulocyte count that is less than 2%, your bone marrow is having an inadequate response. Okay, in this case, it is greater than or equal to 3%, it means you are going to have an adequate response normally because there isn't really no problem with uh, uh, your production of red blood cells. Your bone marrow and all the precursor cells are perfectly fine. The issue is going to happen in the spleen mainly due to the fact that your bone, your red blood cells cannot deform while they go through these uh, uh, the cores of Billroth and they're going to get destroyed. That is one of the main things that's going to happen with, due to extravascular hemolysis. You may see normal to decrease haptoglobin because you're not going to have hemoglobin in circulation, and that hemoglobin is not going to bind to haptoglobin, so you will, you will probably see normal hemoglobin and haptoglobin. You might see normal to increased LDH, lacta, lacta dehydrogenase, and you're going to see an increase in indirect uh, bilirubin. That is very important. It's going to see indirect bilirubin is going to increase. Now, the peripheral blood smear is going to show no spherocytes, but they are going to be positive for echinocytes, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But what you need to know is uh, that is what you need to know is that echinocytes are mainly associated with pyruvate kinate deficiency disease. Okay, that is very very important. Now, the diagnosis can be confirmed with a RBC. Uh, pyruvate kinate assay. So you can look at the amount of pyruvate kinase that patients have in their red blood cells, and based off of that, you can determine whether or not they have a deficiency in pyruvate kinase. Now, these are echinocytes, like we said earlier. They are going to be found in your peripheral blood smear, and they're also known as Burr cells. These right here are echinocytes. Some things to remember, they look very similar to acanthocytes, which are uh, spur cells, like the spur, they look like spurs on a cowboy boot. But the one thing that sets them apart is the fact that their projections right here, you see these projections, are going to be more uniform. So you can have uniform projections in echinocytes. They are different than echinocytes also because they are smaller. They are also smaller in size than uh, acanthocytes. These are going to be associated with end-stage renal disease, uh, liver disease, but in our case, you definitely need to know it for pyruvate kinate deficiency. This is a, probably the most high-yield association for echinocytes. Now, when it comes to treatment of pyruvate kinate deficiency, you can do blood transfusions. And one thing that you always need to watch out for, and from now on you should always be thinking about this, is that you need to chelate iron because these patients can have an iron overloaded state. Okay, You need to watch out for iron overloaded state like hemochromatosis, which can have very detrimental effects to the liver and to the mental status of a patient. So uh, blood transfusions are important with iron chelation therapy, especially if they are iron overloaded. A splenectomy can also be done for very severe cases because uh, the, the red blood cells are being lysed in the spleen, so you can do a splenectomy. What will you see when you have a splenectomy? Howl jolly bodies, okay? That is very, very important. Don't forget that. All right, so you're going to see 
uh, uh, how jolly bodies with a splenectomy. And then finally, you can also give supportive therapy with folate. And with that being said, we have covered pyruvate kinate deficiency. Don't forget, this is an autosomal recessive cause of hemolytic and normocytic anemia. So let's write this down. Autosomal recessive hemolytic normocytic anemia, HNA. That's what we're going to write, HNA. In this case, you have a decreased pyruvate kinase, which leads to decreased ATP, okay? And you're going to have increased 2,3-BPG, and that's going to lead to increased lysis, plus you're going to have decreased hemoglobin O2 affinity, okay? Also, you need to understand that this is all going to happen extravascularly, so you will see extravascular causes of hemolysis and the symptoms associated like decrease, uh, sorry, normal haptoglobin. And uh, in this case, you're going to have an adequate bone marrow response because the bone marrow is not messed up. When you're treating these patients, you can give blood transfusion and a splenectomy in very severe cases. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching our video on pyruvate kinase uh, deficiency. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. You can follow us on social media, on Twitter, and on Instagram, Instagram at mad.medicine, and Twitter at It's Mad Medicine. And you can listen to these podcasts, listen to these lectures as podcasts for free. Just search Mad Medicine, and we will pop up.